Welcome to the Sacred and the Profane podcast. I'm your host, Shannon McNally. We will be speaking with elders, musical luminaries, medicine people, and session players about everyday magic and the past, present, and future of heartfelt and soulful real music. Hi, everybody. This is Shannon McNally, and welcome to the Sacred and the Profane podcast. It is my great pleasure today to be speaking with none other than Ben Montench, um, keyboard extort, keyboard player extraordinaire, of course, played with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers for a very long time, among so many other things. And I'm very excited that you are here today. And I can't wait. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm the extremely profane, although not really. No, <laughs> not. Um, I'm doing great. I'm happy to see you. I haven't seen you in a very, 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 very long time. I know. It's been a But I'm glad long. to see you. Um, I'm doing okay. I'm yeah. having, I don't know what kind of experience I'm having of life because I have a daughter who's three years old mm -hmm. and it's my first child. And um, that's a mind changer. Oh, yeah. That'll keep you on your toes. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like, oh, COVID? Yeah. 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 If you're in Washington, D.C., the end of the world, ah, hey, I got a three-year-old. Right. It, it's just a wonderful, it's not a diversion, but it keeps you centered on, you know. The, it the gives me an important way. task. Yes, it does. And a joyous yes. one. And a joyous one, too. Yeah. You know? What are you working on? What are you, what are you doing next? Well, I've got a record of my own I'm trying to make, and I went in with a great band, just a quartet, uh, to Jonathan Wilson's studio. Mm hmm I want to do it on tape. I have to do it on tape. Um, so I went to Jonathan Wilson's. He's producing and playing drums. Sebastian Steinberg's playing bass. And Taylor Goldsmith is playing guitar. And it's just this beautiful quartet. It just sounds fantastic. At the end of the first day, and we had been tested and masked in the whole nine yards, we had a COVID scare that turned out just to be a scare. And I shut it down. And a week later, or two weeks later, the surge came. The two things I want or to record on tape and not go to Pro Tools at all because it's more expensive these days, I know, but I'm in a fortunate position where I can, right. I can get the tape. And um, sonically and methodically, because when you're on tape and stick to tape and never move to Pro Tools, you don't have a net. You can punch in a line here, you can overdub something, but you can't tune anything, you can't correct the tempo. And there's a psychological thing that goes on. And also, I wanted to do it live. I can't. I don't want to. Um, I'm in a privileged position that if it's safe enough to have four people, right. I can afford to do it that way if it's safe. And music is a communal experience. It's a way to com communicate, to join together, to become yeah. kind of a one mind almost, mm -hmm. hopefully. It's an out-of-body experience. And the other way can yield fantastic results. But if I can do it this way, I want to because, because of the joy and because I'm so old that that's the way that I really know how to do it. You know, that's the way I really know how to do it. But also just for the joy of starting a song. And I didn't know the drummer was going to do that. And the bass player didn't know he was going to do that too. So he's going to correct it and get back to what he was doing. But the drummer is going to think like, oh, wait a minute. The guitar player is going to go say what and wait and not come in until the chorus. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, I mean, I think of it all. It's, it's all alchemy. It's all magic. And however you get to the magic, you know, and I, and I think it's an unfortunate lost art, you know, in, in many ways. So anytime anybody can do it, I think it's amazing. It's, it's really it doesn't feel like anything else, you know, when everybody's in the room together and playing live. And I mean, I just remember those first, the first few experiences I, you know, I, I listened to a lot more music than I had made when I started recording when I, that recording process. And I just, mm -hmm. I was real fortunate in my, my right off the bat, I knew nothing about anything, but I got signed to Capitol records and, and they said, well, who do you want to work with? And I just started opening up records going, is oh, this guy and this guy, is he alive? And, I don't know. How do you do it? How do you, how, how do you find their phone numbers? <laughs> you know, like, who are these people? Um, but, and then, and Pro Tools were just coming in and I didn't want anything to do with it. I didn't know anything about it. So I didn't have the vocabulary to argue with it, but I had these fantastic musicians that I got to work with right away who were all real old school. And 
I kind of, I never recovered from that. That's all I ever wanted to do all ever again, you know, and I've been chasing that my, my whole, my whole time. Yeah. I'm more social now than I was when I was younger. I couldn't be social when I was younger unless I had drugs and alcohol in my system. I don't have those anymore, and I've discovered the joy of being social with people, and I've been sober for a long time. But this is part of it. I mean, the greatest spiritual, genuine spiritual experiences that I have are, you know, music is very high among them, like very high, top three. Yeah. Top three. And the most consistent throughout the course of my life right. as a spiritual or religious or connection experience. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I can do it the way I want to, great. If not, I got to surrender. <laughs> I wanted to have a chance to rock. <laughs> well, yeah. You know? Everything, yeah. I, oh, I hear you. Have you been writing? Have you been writing uh, during the pandemic? Have you had the headspace too? Or are these songs that you wrote previously? Or I think I'm sticking to the stuff that was between 2014 and 2017. But if I find a way to use some of this stuff, the newest song I think I wrote on tour when Alice was pregnant with Catherine, mm. uh, like three and a half years ago. Mm. But you never know. <laughs> Have you had anything that you thought, well, this is a plus that came out of this? This well, it's a, is absolutely. It's an education. It's a self. It's a self learning thing because I'm still a pacifist. I I was born in the fifties and. I was 15 in 1968 when everything went screaming and tumbling down mm -hmm. and the peace movement and all that stuff. And so that made a big impact on me and I believe it. And I grew up going to Presbyterian church and I, by the time I was like 14 or 15, I was like, well, if this guy meant anything, they're kind of crucifying him again by the way they're trying to teach you stuff. But it was a good church full of kind people. Um, mm -hmm. But the lessons learned as a child um, from a tolerant form of Christianity, from an inclusive form of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, man, that, there's a lot of really good, strong, powerful, important stuff there. And it's all inclusiveness and it's all, um, it, it's pretty deep stuff. My current religious or spiritual life is informed by that, but it's informed equally by the Tao and by all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, right now it's informed by uh, that Todd Rundgren album and by a song called Remember Me that is probably less than a minute long that closes that record. It's just, just mm -hmm. devastating and gorgeous. It's informed by the Beach Boys, my spiritual and moral and religious experience. It's informed by Aretha. Oh, it's oh. just the heart. It's just the heart. Something grabs you. And... It can be, for me, art is a really good way because I never took psychedelics, although I'm a kid of the 60s and so on. Mm -hmm. I never did. Um, and so what has always taken me on anything like that, any kind of out-of-body experience, has mostly been music. You know, sex can take you definitely out-of-body experience. Music, art... I made myself sit for some reason. I don't know if I was waiting for somebody. I just went, listen, I've got to see what this is. Monet painted these enormous paintings, mm -hmm. very impressionistic, very, you've got to sit there to figure out what it is of the lily pond backyard that he built this mm -hmm. enormous garden. And these canvases that I think I was in a room, there were three side by side. And you walk in the room, there's this blur of color, and it's like, what the hell is this? And you sit down, and it just comes out of the fog. It comes out of the fog, and it comes to you. And that can give you some kind, that can take you somewhere really, really good. It's not an escape. It brings you deeper in. Right. Um, it's going to be the Elvis singing Blue Moon. Yeah. No. You know, no, 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 I hear you. No, I mean, for me, it's like I've had these moments uh, playing live, you know, playing music. But before that, 
watching music, going to see music, where in hindsight, now as an adult, I look back and I think, well, because I remember these moments so very clearly, like, you know, I was 15 years old and I remember exactly where I was standing and who was standing next to me. And I mean, I remembered the moment so clearly. And I realized what was happening was that, you know, it just was this, like, my, sh it was like, the only thing I can compare it to ever, ever, ever since was just this, like, grand opening of all my, sh like, it had to be a chakra opening where, like, all of the chakras in my body just went, and it was an outer body experience. And it was so exciting. And it, and it changed the chemistry of my body. And it changed the chemistry of my thoughts and it changed the trajectory of my life and that's mm -hmm. you know that's what live music that's what live music does to me it's some kind of an explosion and it can move you so deeply um i when i was 18 or something i saw james cotton the james cotton blues band mm -hmm. play a little club paul's mall or something in a basement in in um boston and yeah. Good Lord, I knew who James Cotton was, but his band, he had Matt Murphy playing guitar. I didn't know who this guy was, but I took note. I remember just genuinely sitting at a small table at the very front. The band must have thought, this kid's out of his skull, because I was going out of my skull. I was like almost being a whirling dervish in my seat. I was completely headbanging to James Cotton, to the James Cotton Blues Band. It tore my brain wide open. There's a chord change when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, and I heard the Beatles play She Loves You, and this one chord came in. That took my head open. When you're around the people that are really, really good, whether you're playing with them or just in the audience or listening on a record, they take you in, and they pull you in, and you're with them. You're with them. You are with Aretha Franklin yeah. when she sings um, well, when she sings Natural Woman, you're with Aretha when she sings anything. That's the difference with Aretha and all the other people who swoop and swirl with their vocals. Is Aretha, there's a different thing there. Tammy Wynette, absolutely. Same thing. Gillian Welch can oh, just well, calmly. Like, God, she's so Gill, Gill just calmly pulls you there. Nobody realizes how great a singer David is either. And David's one of the best guitar players I've ever encountered, but... They pull you in, and it's honesty, and that's the thing that, there was always silliness in rock and roll. There were always contrived pop songs. There were always people right. that just spectacle more than they have substance. And they're a lot of fun sometimes. It's just really fun and really cathartic to see that stuff. Right. But to be drawn in and illuminated and blown up into the most joyous experience that you ever had in your life, and to be brought in. The Beatles brought you in. Ray Charles brings you in. Helen Wolf absolutely brings you in. Memphis Minnie brings you in. Fiona brings you in. Um, everybody brings you in, you know. And you know, because you, know you know how to do that too, because we played together a long, long time ago on a record, and, it, and Neil was on it too, yep. right? Yeah. With, with Jim Scott, Neil was on yep. it. Yeah. You know? yeah. That was beautiful. And on Pure Lightning. I was actually in the broom closet at Cello. <laughs> we had a little studio That's right. set up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Neil and I were yeah. like, we were so, I really knew nothing about anything. I had just come out to L.A. I barely knew how to write songs. I didn't, you could barely, I barely figured out my voice. I, I didn't know how to make records. But I, I got lucky, right? I mean, on the, you know, Greg Lease and Jim Keltner were the literally the first two people I made I music with. And yeah, I, and I thought like, oh, well, this crazy. isn't hard. This isn't going to be hard. I mean, you just call these guys and, and um, they'll tell you. And, you know, I, and I gleaned, I learned everything I needed to know just by being in the presence of other people. Musicians to me are supposed, they're the ones that bring you in. They're the ones that have a groove that envelops you. They're the ones that envelop your song or the song of whatever artist you're working with. Um, and my whole life has been surrounded by people who were brilliant at doing that. 
I quit school when I was 19. I'd been sitting in with Patty and Campbell for a couple of years by then, whenever I was home from school. And I quit school at 19. When I was 20, came out to California with them. But Patty always had the knowledge that he didn't have. He, he wanted more. And he could spot the real thing. And he knew it. When he's just like, it's, it's Tommy Petty. He's like 21 and I'm 18 or something. He's three years older than me. I go see him play a club. My friend is the roadie. They play a bunch of covers. They play Grant Parsons. They play Bob Dylan B-sides. They play Chuck Berry stuff I've never heard in my life. All this great stuff. And they play this song. And I say to my friend, who wrote that? And he said, Tom wrote that when he was like 17. I'm like, what? I heard a tape somebody gave me a couple of years ago of us playing in 1973. And there's Mike Campbell, full blown in 1973. Like deep and powerful and economical and capable of just going, oh, you want a flurry of fast notes? I'll put them where they're supposed to be. All that kind of thing. And I, my entire life was surrounded. I got to play with Keltner really early on um, with Bob Dylan. Got to play with Russ Kunkel, Bob Glaub, Danny Korshmar. All these folks that once I was in this band with Tom and Mike mm -hmm. and, and Stan and, and, and Ron and Howie later. And Tom didn't want anybody to do any recording sessions. Tom thought, this is the band. This is a really special band. This is the sound of this band. And I don't want y'all going putting that Hammond sound on somebody else's record right now. Right. First major session I did, Jimmy Iovine called me up and said, hey, I'm going to work with Bob Dylan tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody on the session. I want you to come along so somebody that I know and understand will be in the room. So I go what down there. What year was that? Do you remember? It was like 81, I think, for the Shot of Love record. And Jimmy and Bob didn't get along. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy walked out in the middle of the session. And I'm there. I don't know. I don't know any of these guys. Jim Keltner was on drums. Tim Drummond was on bass. And they introduced themselves. To That's me. the band I was then, trying to have. <laughs> That's my band. They, they introduced themselves to me when I walked in because they knew I was a fish out of water. And they were so sweet. So sweet. Yeah. And that, I said, where's Jimmy? Because I wanted to ask him about something. He said, oh, he left. I'm like, what? And so I'm in this session with nobody I know, including Bob. But I, I fell into, I learned to play recording sessions from Danny Korchmar and Jim Kellner and Russ Kunkel and Bob Glob and Waddy Wachtel and all these cats yeah. that really knew the deep stuff. Steve Ripley, yeah. just unfathomable. But there's a way in which you've kind of gone blind because the communal experience of making music has overpowered everything else. And that's, and I, I live for that. And the pandemic makes it a lot, a lot more difficult. The generosity of spirit that you're talking about, the only thing that you can do with that once you've received it is do the same thing. It's do the same thing. And there's a club out here called Largo that used to be this tiny little club. And then they put it in a 280 seat theater, but kept the vibe. And until the pandemic came, that was my life's blood. The Heartbreakers would tour every year or so, and that's a joyous thing. Just really, because those cats, I could just, Mike and Tom and I, especially, but everybody in that band, but Mike and Tom and I have played together for decades, for decades and decades and decades. And that was a thing that can't even be expressed. But I would go to Largo and play with, you know, Greg Lees. Sarah Watkins, Sean Watkins, Don Heavington, Sebastian Steinberg, Mike Elizondo. Mm -hmm. People would come sit in. Booker T came one night and we brought my Hammond and they had their upright and we sat back to back and switched off between uh, piano and upright all night. And you wouldn't know the songs, half the songs, you kind of learned them in front of an audience. I ramble a lot, don't I? That's I'm not, all right. It's, That's all right. <laughs> it's, it's almost 33 it's years. It's almost 33 years since I've had anything stronger than caffeine. <laughs> I, I talk like a speed. Well, you know what? You think you think like you think like somebody who did a lot of uh, psychedelics. So clearly, your brain was already there. So you don't have to do psychedelics. <laughs> I want to do psychedelics. That's that's it's the been, point of getting past the trauma 
and PTSD of, of life, yeah. you know, and to feel that connectivity, but because you've had so many incredible connections, you know, and you've, I mean, you know, you play in front of tens of thousands of people and you are having a mass experience. It's an amazing mass experience and there's nothing like it. However, there's nothing like playing to any number of people if you have the connection. Yeah. Whether it's 1,500 or 15,000, it doesn't really bloody matter. Or whether it's 15 people. Yeah. Because we have played places where there are definitely more people in the band than there were in the audience. Um, Me too. <laughs> if you connect, yeah, if you connect, you connect. And that's there are more people behind the bar than there were in the audience. I went to college for two years at Tulane. Oh, right. And I got to see Professor Longhair play a few times. Oh, wow. And even opened for him in the worst band in the world. Not only were we the worst band in the world, but the rhythm <laughs> set they decided they weren't speaking to each other. So we we're booked for this engagement. And for at least a month before the gig, for at least a month before the gig, they aren't speaking together. So we can't get together and go over a note, but we have to fulfill this obligation. And we're going on before my hero, before, before you know, God in a turban, because sometimes he still wore the turban. Right. And we were the worst thing in the world, but him, that rhythm, that thing, all that stuff, Memphis and New Orleans is where American rock and roll came out of. A meteor hit in the Gulf. Yeah, New Orleans. New Orleans is really, really important. And you, music in New Orleans can just take you somewhere. I got to see Dr. John a whole bunch, and I saw him on a tour a few years before he passed away. Well, yeah, well, New Orleans, they're pulling it oh. from a well that is infinite. There's no bottom. There's no bottom to that well. And that's why it, it just lights you up when the minute you, the minute you feel it. I mean, I, I moved to New Orleans. I mean, I, I saw Rebirth and was like, hmm. There's a Dixieland kind of thing that's beautiful where everybody's playing at once, but they're playing something that somehow works all that. Mm -hmm. There's an MC5 song called Sister Anne, and they get toward the outro and, um, or toward the solo, and the guitar comes in and starts and it's great and then a harmonica comes in that's great a second lead guitar comes in and plays lead while the first one is playing lead and they aren't related and another harmonica comes in and they're all playing this glorious stuff all over each other i don't know if it was planned or if it's because they listened to a lot of modern jazz in the mc5 but they're jazz heads um and understood this but it's it's not a cacophony and it's in concert, even though it sounds, it doesn't sound in principle like it could be. It's many voices and they're still all speaking, but there's one harmony that comes out of it or one thing that, that works together that comes yeah. out of it. I'm excited about your record. I hope it comes together in February. I hope that, you know, all the obstacles get out of your way and everybody's I healthy hope, and it's good to go. I hope so too. Do you have one out and coming out? Or you just... I have a record coming out in 2021. I did a record of all... It's all Waylon Jennings. I, oh. never, I never heard a woman sing any of it. And I thought, man, it must be nice to be Waylon Jennings. I'm going to try that on for a minute and see how it feels. I can't wait. What nobody a... talk back to me for a minute. <laughs> I loved that guy. I didn't know him well. Waylon was really something. I agree. All the way down the line. Waylon was really something. There's some songs I can't wait to hear you sing. Thanks. I, I'm, I'll send it to you. I am, man, this was like, it, and talk about like a bolt of lightning coming out of nowhere. I mean, I'd listened to him my whole life. Waylon, my experience of Waylon was he was really, he was really sweet and he was confident, but he doesn't, didn't seem arrogant, um, which is always a good thing. But yeah, he was, oh yeah, I can't wait to hear that. I cannot wait to hear that. Ben, thank you very much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. I love talking to you. And here yeah, same here. We, we can do it again sometime if you want. Uh, All right. I actually interview you, so I'll shut up and stop talking. <laughs> All right. Well, I like listening to you talk. So. Buona notte, buona sera. Not y'all. Thank <laughs> y'all.